All right. So we are picking up on uh, module five. So this module is on diodes. So last time in class, we talked, we started by talking about the applications of diodes and why they're important. We gave up some examples of that, for example, like fiber optic communications, uh, sensors, uh, rectifiers, and things like that. We'll touch on uh, rectifiers and a few things in this module later, but we talked about just the applications to give an appreciation. And then the main thing we spent time on last time was looking at the equilibrium behavior of the diode. Okay. And I'll go over that really quickly today, and then we'll get into the details of the equilibrium model. We're going to go look into the physics of the space charge region, the depletion region, uh, and then we'll derive some of the relationships um, that have to do with space charge neutrality, the width of the junction, the charge densities, the electric fields, and then the built-in potential. So there's a lot of math that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have, if you feel like you're getting lost at any point, let me know and I'm, I'm happy to uh, go over it again. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a quick a reiteration of uh, last time, like in this module, we're talking about uh, diodes. Uh, this is what we had in our mind for like physical model of what's happening in the space charge region. I'll go over that in a second. And we talked about the energy band model last time. And we talked a little bit about the differences of a diode and a resistor. So the key thing about the physical interpretation of the diode is that you have an n-type and a p-type material that are next to each other. Now, um, Melvin brought up a good question in, uh, you know, when we were talking earlier this week, he, he said, well, are the n-type and p-type materials like physically put next to each other? And um, the answer to that is actually no, um, because if you take two materials and put them next to each other, there's gonna be small air gaps between them. And in order for you to make a good diode, you actually have to have a very clean interface between these two materials. So the way they're actually made is that you start off with a p-type wafer, and then you diffuse in an n-type region into that p-type wafer. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but uh, uh, I just want to mention that so, so I want to clear up any confusion that I may have caused in a previous lecture. Okay, so P-type and N-type materials right next to each other, just imagine that you have like um, your N-type material has the, the uh, column five doping with an electron here uh, that it donated uh, P-type material with a hole. And uh, the key thing that happens in equilibrium is that you have uh, both diffusion and then drift. Uh, and you also end up having some recombination as well. So let's talk about the, those three processes that happens um, from the n-type materials or the p-type material, you have high electron concentration here, low electron concentration here. So this electron hill here will uh, diffuse over to the other side. And when it gets over to the other side, there's a lot of holes on this side. So it finds a hole and it recombines. So it recombines there. And um, in, in the case of the p-type semiconductor, like you have the, the high hole concentration on the left. So the holes diffuse over to the right. And after the diffusing over to the right, they also see a, a region with lots of electrons. So there's a high probability that it'll recombine. And so what you end up with is at the interface, you end up with a region where um, it doesn't have any mobile electrons or holes. What it does have is these uh, charged um, immobile ions. Okay, And this is called a space charge region or a depletion region. Uh, the n-type material has effective positive charge because the arsenic dopant ions have an effective uh, positive one charge, boron ions have a negative uh, one uh, effective charge. Okay, and there are many of these charges. Okay, we're gonna be talking about those charges today. So I wanna make sure we re reiterate and we understand uh, this concept here. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of positive charges on this side. There's a whole bunch of negative charges on this side. So whenever you have a situation where you have a bunch of positive charges and then a bunch of negative charges, that is creates that creates an electric field. The electric field points. Um, the electric field points from positive to negative. Okay, so basically, this space charge region is creating an electric field. Okay, the depletion regions has created an electric field. Okay, the reason it's called depletion region. Um, there's two words for this that mean the same thing. The depletion region uh, represents the fact that this region is depleted of mobile carriers, is depleted of electrons and holes. Space charge region means it's a region that just has these space charges in it, the immobile ions. So you can use the terms interchangeably. 
Okay, so the key thing here is that the electric field causes drift current to happen. So the electrons drift opposite the electric field, the holes drift in the same direction as the electric field. So overall, the electrons diffuse from right to left, but then they drift from left to right. The holes, similarly, they diffuse from left to right, but then they drift from right to left. At equilibrium, the drift and diffusion currents balance each other. So the electron drift plus electron diffusion sum up to zero. The whole drift and the whole diffusion sum up to zero. Okay, that's where we left off uh, last time. Uh, we did talk about the energy band diagram um, model as well. And we basically, I showed you a way to step-by-step -step draw, uh, um, draw the band diagram for a PN junction at equilibrium. We talked about band bending. Uh, we talked about how to find the built-in potential. We talked about the fact that, uh, that the slope in the band diagram represents an electric field. Uh, we talked about like how um, you form an energy barrier that uh, prevents the diffusion of electrons from, from N-type to P-type. Similarly, uh, um, it prevents the diffusion of P-type to N-type. So only the high energy electrons diffuse over here. Okay, this energy barrier is going to become very important when we start talking about the um, forward bias and reverse bias. All right. Uh, the last thing we did is we talked about um, a way to derive the uh, built-in potential. Um, one way of finding the built-in potential is just by uh, figuring out how much curvature you have in the energy band diagram. And the other way of doing it is by uh, just using this simple formula here. KT over Q, ln of Na, Nd over Ni squared. That is the built-in potential. All right, so crash course we covered uh, last week, or last lecture on Monday. All right, now we're gonna talk about more of the specifics, the electrostatics in the depletion region. Okay, so uh, we're peeling back the layers of the onion here. So we're going into a little bit more detail. We're gonna become more quantitative. We just had, thus far, we just had a very qualitative description of what's happening. Now we're gonna become more quantitative and derive some relationships. So the things that we wanna ask here, the things that we're interested in uh, have to have to do with these four questions. Okay, first of all, what is the charge density in the two sides of the depletion region? Okay, we can see from this diagram that I've drawn here that, uh, and from what I showed you earlier, that uh, the P side of the junction has negatively charged immobile ions. Those boron dopants, the boron nuclei, are have an effective negative one charge, and those are shown in black circles here. The positively charged uh, ions that you see on the right side are the column five dopant ions, and every dopant uh, has an effective uh, positive one charge, just in the depletion region, okay? Notice that the space charge region doesn't extend through the entire P and N material. It's only at the interface, okay? And so we're actually gonna calculate what the width of this depletion region is. We're gonna calculate the charge densities of this interface uh, we're going to look at the, um, the potential difference that results from this electric field here. So all the electrostatics of it is what we're going to cover today. What is the charge density on the, uh, on the P and the N sides? What is the electric field? Uh, where is the electric field hit a maximum? And how does the electrostatic potential vary as we move across from left to right? And then what is the width? Okay, so all those questions we'll talk about. Uh, one important thing that we're going to start off with, and this is an uh, approximation or an assumption that uh, I would like for you to um, just sort of like take at face value right now and just trust me on this. Okay, this is something called the depletion approximation. Uh, and that depletion approximation states that the charge density in the depletion region is due only to donor and acceptor ions. So basically what that means is that we're assuming that there are no electrons and holes in the space charge region. Now, even if there are, they're, they're, um, their concentration is negligible. Okay. The reason why this might be a leap of faith right now is because you might be asking yourself, well, it's an N-type and P-type semiconductor. We just talked about holes moving back and forth. Shouldn't there be holes in that region? 
So the first time I saw this material, it didn't really make sense to me either. But if you think about it a little bit, it does make sense. Um, now, I'll tell you why. Because in this region, you have uh, holes and electrons that diffused over this way. So they left this region and they created this electric field. Now, if a hole or electron happens to be in a region where there's a large electric field, what's gonna happen to a charged particle when you put it in an electric field? It'll move. It'll move, that's right. It gets accelerated. So the fact that you have the strong electric field that may, that built up in the middle here means that um, any ch any uh, hole or electron that shows up in here will quickly get swept out one way or the other, depending on what charge it is. If it's an electron, if it's an electron, it'll um, uh, the electric field is pointed from right to left, so the electrons will quickly um, you know drift over to this direction, and the holes will drift over to this direction. Okay. So um, that's this point that I'm making here. The electric field sweeps out, uh, sweeps out the carriers. Okay, that's why this region is called a depletion region. Yeah, there's a very low concentration of electrons and holes. And uh, because of these immobile ions, it has a very strong electric field. All right, so now let's get into the electrostatics of the depletion region. Okay, so in this part, uh, I suggest that you, if you have your notes out, you can, um, you know, scratch notes in uh, on the PDFs if you're able to. Um, you can also take out a separate sheet of paper and just try to follow along um, to write down some of these things that we're going through. Okay, because I think it's important that uh, that you understand how some of these things are derived because we're going to talk about just some basic electrostatics here, some fundamental electrostatics. And these are some of the fundamentals that would really be helpful for you in analyzing different um, semiconductor devices, not just a diode. Okay. These are fundamental skills in, um, in analyzing these devices. All right. So um, the first uh, concept I want you to see is that the depletion region looks like a uh, capacitor. Now, what do we mean by that? We talked about this in class last time. One of the very basic electrical systems that we think about is a capacitor. A capacitor is uh, where you have a voltage source like this. So if you put a voltage across a capacitor, which is basically two metal plates uh, next to each other with a small gap between them, you end up getting a buildup of positive charge on one side of the plate, and then you get an equal charge buildup on the opposite side. Now, notice I said equal because this is a key. This is a key thing that has to do with capacitors and also with diodes. The way that capacitors, the, the electrostatics of the capacitor, has this concept of electrostatic neutrality. Okay, so that means that whatever charge buildup you have on the top plate you have an equal and opposite charge buildup on the bottom plate. And then of course you get um, an electric field indicated by the arrows and the electric field is oriented from positive to negative. Okay. And by the way, if you're curious um, for a capacitor, Q equals CV. You know, you've probably seen this before if you're an electrical engineer, if you're not an electrical engineer, um, then um, there's the simple relationship is Q is uh, the charge in Coulombs uh, equals C is the capacitance and uh, um, the, the units for capacitance is farads and then the, uh, the volt voltage is given by V. So what this is saying is that um, the charge is proportional to the voltage. So if I had a voltage here and I, if I doubled the voltage, I doubled the amount of charge uh, on the capacitor, okay? So that's that's what a capacitor is. So when we look at this PN junction, we can apply, you know, this looks a lot like a capacitor because it has a buildup of positive charge and a buildup of negative charge on the opposite end. 
And it turns out that the rule of electrostatic neutrality applies here. And specifically with the diode, it's called space charge equality. Okay, that's the second point here. Um, electromagnetics tells us that the total number of positive charges must equal the number of negative charges. And um, in the book, you know, they have this diagram here that shows this nicely. It shows that there, if you count up, this is uh, three by four. So there's 12 positive charges here. And they also draw 12 negative charges here. Okay. Now, the question I'd like to ask the class now is why is this diagram drawn in a fashion that this is, seems to be wide and then this seems to be narrow? Does it have to do with the mass of the holes being bigger or no? No, that's a, that's a good thought, but that's, that's not what we're looking for. It doesn't have to do with mass. Um, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. First of all, like with holes, like this is, because this is the depletion region, we're not really thinking about what the holes are doing here. The holes and electrons, we're just kind of like ignoring them for the time being. So these things, um, what type of charges are these then? Where are these charges coming from? The negative charges and positive charges. Ions. The dopant ions, right? Mm -hmm. So why, it, so let me give you a hint here. Why would the density of ions on this side be less than the density of ions on this side? What do I mean by that? You see how the, here the ions are pretty close together on the right side. And on the left side, the, the ions seem to be spaced out a little bit further apart. Why would that happen? Why might that happen? <laughs> um, I guess I'm not actually not not um, don't have too much of an idea, but could it have something to do with the the doping. That's right. Yeah, you got it. That's exactly right. Excellent. Um, it has to do with the doping. Now, in this example, in this example in the book. This is a um, PN plus diode. What does that mean? If it's a PN plus, that means that ND, the doping on the N side, is greater than the doping on the acceptor side. Okay, so let me go over what I mean by that. In this example, you can see that the, um, uh, the positive charges are crammed together in this gray region here, okay? The density of these positive charges has to do with the doping density. When we calculate doping density, you know, you've, you see numbers like 10 to the 17th, five times 10 to the 18th, you know, the numbers like that. That tells you the number of dopant ions per centimeter cubed. Okay, so for every dopant ion that you have, you're gonna end up with one of these immobile uh, positive charges, okay? So in this example, the, the doping density on the N side, so ND, which stands for the donor density, so this is the doping on the N side, is greater than the doping on the P side. The, so uh, the NA is the acceptor density, all right? That's why it kind of looks like these negative charges are spaced out a little bit further apart from each other. Okay. So space charge equality tells us that the number of positive charges on this side has to equal the number of negative charges on this side. So if the negative charges happen to be more spaced out than the positive charges, that means that there has to be a larger width on this side. So the side that has lower doping has to be wider, proportionally wider than the side that has a higher doping density. 
Okay, so I'll show you the formula for that on the next slide. But just asking this question now, suppose that the P region has twice the doping of the N region. So the acceptor density is twice the um, uh, density of the donors. Okay, so that is not like this example. In this example, the donor density is greater than the acceptor density. Here, um, so I'm looking at this uh, discussion question here. In this discussion question, the P region has twice the doping of the N region. So this would be a considered a P plus N diode. Okay, the P plus means that the P side has a higher doping than the N side. So um, the P side has twice the doping of the N side. What will be the difference in widths of the two regions? Any thoughts? Take a guess. <laughs> okay, no guesses. Uh, the difference is the difference in widths. Basically, whichever side has you know, the side that has twice the doping. So the acceptor side, the P side, has twice the doping of the N side. That means the P side is going to have half the width of the N side. So in other words, the N side will be two X as wide as the P side. Okay, I'm gonna go over a formula for that on the next slide. Okay, uh, now um, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So starting with uh, this uh, charge density plot here. Okay, so this uh, with this green dotted line that you see here, um, this green dotted line is intended to line up the plot of charge density with the PN junction, okay? So what is on this plot? X represents the position, X equals zero. That represents the interface between the P and the N regions. So the interface is X equals zero, the green dotted line. The Y axis is showing charge density, okay? Charge density means the number of charges per centimeter cubed. Okay, I'll, I'll put that in here for reference. Okay, so ND has the units of um, uh, one over centimeter cubed. You multiply that by charge. So the units for charge density is coulombs per centimeter cubed. And what you can see here is that the charge density on this side of the diagram, on the end side, is equal to Q times ND. Now, why is that? Think about it. ND is the number of dopant ions per centimeter cubed. So ND, again, the number of dopant ions per centimeter cubed. So it has a units one over centimeter cubed. And then Q represents the charge per dopant ion. So every dopant ion has a plus one charge, and that has that is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So every one of these positive signs that you see here is contributing 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs of charge. So you get a plot that looks something like this. The charge density is positive here in the depletion region. So we're kind of making this, uh, um, assumption that the depletion charge here, it stays fixed. And then right at the edge of the depletion region, the charge density goes back down to zero. Why does the charge density go back down to zero? Well, 
in the N and P regions, these, are these regions are considered electrostatically neutral. Okay. Charge density happens when you have immobile charges. Okay. So one question that students sometimes ask is, well, how can N and P, how can these regions out here, how can they be electrostatically neutral? You have electrons, you have holes, like those are charged particles. Well, it turns out that they're, they, they are in fact like electrostatically uh, neutral. Okay, because the number of, uh, um, we talked about this in module three a little bit, but the whole, the electrons in the N region, which have an effective negative charge, are balanced out with the positively charged dopant ions that, are, that exist in this N type material. So that's why it's electrostatically neutral. And then in the P type material, the, the positively charged holes are balanced out by the negatively charged dopant ions. So these regions are electrostatically neutral, but in these regions, they're not because the mobile electrons and holes have left and they've left behind those just the positive and negative uh, dopant ions. Then that region becomes electrostatically non-neutral. Any questions so far? Have I lost anyone yet? <laughs> One sec. Okay. All right, so um, positive charge here. Okay, charge density is positive here, and then it goes down to zero at the edge of the depletion region. So at the edge of the depletion region, we call this location Xn0. So Xn0 represents the width of the depletion region on the N side. Okay, so this distance here is given by Xn0, excuse me, is given by Xn0. That's also shown here on the plot. All right, so if this is charge density, then uh, one thing, one little visual aspect that we can have, oh, let me come back, come back to that in a second. Um, on the negative side, the charge density here is negative and the charge density here is equal to Q times Na. Again, Na is the number of um, acceptor ions which have an effect one negative charge uh, and you multiply that by Q, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And there's a negative sign here because each one of these ions contributes a negative charge. So the charge density remains negative until the edge of the depletion region here at XP0. And then it goes to, then uh, the charge density here goes to zero. So now, once we have the charge density, we can think about, well, what is the total charge? Charge density has units coulombs per centimeter cubed. So how are we gonna get the total charge? We need to know the size or the, the volume that's contained within. Mm -hmm. We need to multiply by the size. Um, uh, we need to basically, we need to multiply by a volume. Okay, <laughs> so coulombs per centimeter cubed. So we need to multiply that by a volume in order to get the total charge. Um, so that's where this formula comes in. The total positive charge is equal to Q times ND. So these two terms we know already, Q times ND, that's the charge density. And we're multiplying by the area of the diode and the width of the diode. All right, so just for everybody's reference, um, I'm gonna show you here what a real diode might look like. Um, well, actually, no, I'll still talk about a hypothetical diode like this. So let's say you have your p-type material here. So this is your um, p-type material, and then this is your n-type material. And then in between the two regions,
All right, this is the interface between the two materials. Okay, so I'm just going to color this in green here. This is the interface between the P and the N materials. So this has an area referred to as A, that is the area of the diode, okay? And then when they're talking about the X sub P, so the depletion region, sorry, X sub N, so this is the width of, this represents the width of the depletion region on the N side. Okay, so this entire volume, this is the volume of the depletion region. Okay, and I'll just, I guess I'll show this, this entire volume here, volume of the cube is the depletion region on the N side. So the volume of that is given by X sub N times the cross-sectional area A. So that's where the X sub N and A are coming from. So these two terms here, now we've, these two terms represent the volume. Okay. So you've taken the charge density, which is Q times ND, you multiply by the volume represented by A times XN zero, and that gives you the uh, total charge density. So on the opposite sides, you do something similar. Q negative is equal, the total negative charge is equal to negative Q times A times XP zero times NA. All right, so we have formulas now for the positive charge, the, the amount of positive space charge and the amount of negative space charge. Now we come back to the space, uh, the space charge law, the charge conservation law. Also, you can say the space charge equality law, okay? We found these two relationships that gave us the, um, uh, the total charge in the positive and negative sides of the uh, space charge region. And now we have the charge conservation law, which states that Q plus and Q minus have to be the same. The amount of positive charge on one side has to be equal to the negative charge on the other. Okay, notice we have these absolute value signs here. All right, so if we just take these two relationships that we derived up here and set them equal to each other, the absolute values equal to each other, then we can see that Q times A times ND XN zero is equal to Q times A times NA XP zero. The Qs and As cancel and they leave us with this. ND times XN zero is equal to NA times XP zero. So what does that equation mean? This equation is useful because it relates the doping densities, ND and NA, to the relative widths, okay? So the, the way that I often would use, or we'd often use this equation is, you'll be given a ratio of ND over NA based on the doping ratio, remember, ND is the doping density on the N side and A is the doping density on the P side. If you know the ratio of doping, ND over NA, that gives you the ratio XP zero over XN zero. So the doping density gives you the ratio of widths in the, um, uh, on the two sides of the junction. So if ND happens to be large, if ND happens to be large, that means X sub P is going to be large, okay? Based on this relationship, if ND goes up, then XP, if ND over NA goes up, 
So if the doping on the N side is, um, let's say 10 times greater than the doping on the P side, then the width on the P side is 10 times greater than the doping and then the width on the N side. Okay, so it's inversely related. Whichever side has the higher doping will have the smaller depletion width. I'll say that again, that whichever side has the higher doping density will have a smaller depletion width. Okay, so where are we at right now? Any questions thus far? All right. Uh, so a little bit more about the equilibrium behavior of the depletion region. Uh, some of these concepts you already know, so uh, just bear with me. The diffusion of carriers leaves behind a region of charged ions called the depletion region. The, char the, the density of charges can be approximated as a step function shown in B. Okay, so we, we just showed this a second ago. The charge density goes up to some value and then it goes abruptly to zero. This is an approximation. There's actually some gradation here, but um, we, can, uh, we can ignore that for the purposes of, of this analysis. There's a negative charge density on this side. And when we say that the total charge is equal to each other, Q plus is equal to Q minus, one way that we can visually see that on this graph one way we can visually see that on this graph is that we can say that the area of this rectangle, the area of this rectangle has to equal the area of this rectangle. Why is that? Well, the areas of the two things are the same. Okay, so that, um, then you have Q times X, Xn zero times Nd is equal to Q times Xp zero times X, Xn A. So that's what, that's what this is. And um, basically the Q plus is equal to Q minus implies that the areas of these have to be the same. All right, so visually, when you draw your graphs, keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Uh, so now we're going to go through how we can get to the electric field and then how we can ultimately get to a plot of the electrical potential. So we're going to do a full electrostatic analysis of the depletion region. Um, and in order to do that, we have to do some integrations. Uh, so what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to integrate the, uh, um, we're, if we integrate the charge density, we can get the total charge. And then when we integrate, again, uh, we, we can integrate to find the electric field, and then we can integrate the electric field to find the potential. I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, the, length of, the, the length of the positive and negative depletion regions may be different, but the area, uh, positive and negative, are equal. We talked about that, space charge neutrality. Uh, we also talked about that the space charges uh, create an electric field. So positive charges here, negative charges here, they create an electric field. And whenever you have an electric field, it creates a uh, built-in potential. If we look at our basic capacitor, if I go back to our basic capacitor here, uh, Q is equal to CV. And if you remember another relationship that we talked about is um, V equals E times D, or in other words, V over D is equal to the electric field. So what I'm trying to say here is that whenever you have an electric field, you have an associated voltage, okay? So just like that here, we have an electric field here. So there's gonna be an associated electrical potential between these two. And that electrical potential, by the way, is the classic 0.7 volts that we see in a silicon diode. All right, so now let's talk about electrostatics and how we're gonna go through this derivation of the electrostatics of the depletion region. 
So let's just grab a quick sip of water. Okay. So in order to do this, we're gonna to need to review some concepts in electrostatics. And I know that some of you, maybe many of you haven't taken an electrostatics course before, and that's okay. Um, so I wanna go over some of these basic concepts with you first. So the key thing here is the relationship between charge, electric field, and voltage is similar to the concepts of acceleration, velocity, and displacement that you probably studied in a physics, physics class. So what do we know about mechanics? Uh, one of the key concepts is that uh, velocity is the derivative of displacement. So V equals dx dt, where x is the displacement. And then the other concept you learned was that acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So acceleration is equal to dv dt. So if you have, so if we look at this uh, specifically, um, there we go. Uh, we can uh, show it on this uh, on this chart here. Um, the key concept is this: is that just like you know acceleration, velocity, and displacement, um, you know with displacement you can do derivative to find velocity, take the derivative of velocity to find acceleration. You can go in the opposite direction take the integral of acceleration and you'll get velocity, take the integral of velocity and you'll get displacement, okay? So there's a similar thing we can do in electrostatics when we talk about voltage, electric field, and charge. But uh, I just wanna go over the specifics of the mechanical one first so we have a basis for which to understand the electrostatics. So let's start off with a displacement. Let's say we have a displacement W, okay? So if we take the derivative of displacement, the velocity is equal to dW dt. You take the derivative of velocity, you get acceleration. So acceleration is dV dt. All right, so we went down this arrow. And if you want to go, if you have acceleration, you can figure out velocity and displacement. So the velocity, when you, you take the integral, the velocity is equal to the integral of negative infinity to time t of the acceleration. So what does this mean? We're taking the velocity, uh, we're taking the integral of all accelerations before a certain time point from negative infinity till time t of the acceleration signal, all right? So um, when you take the integral of everything to, uh, from negative infinity to t, that means what you're doing is you're finding the area under the curve of everything to the left of a certain point. So if we, let's say your acceleration signal looks something like this. Let's say we are at time t, okay? So let's say this is our acceleration signal. So the velocity, at time t is going to be the area under the curve of everything to the left of t. Okay. So that's how we take our integral here, negative infinity to time t. Similarly, if we want to find the displacement, we have to take the integral of the velocity. So the uh, uh, displacement, is equal to negative infinity to time t of v of t dt. Same thing as we did uh, previously, okay? Now, with electrostatics, the similar thing holds with voltage, electric field, and charge respectively. So charge, voltage is at the top, uh, top level here, then there's electric field, and then there's charge. So what are we doing with voltage? Now, I wanna point out that one important difference here is that with mechanics, you're taking the derivative with respect to time. And in electrostatics, we're talking about uh, you know, derivatives and integrals with respect to uh, distance x. Right. 
So, but I, I still think the analogy is quite valuable here. So if you start off with voltage, you have voltage as a function of space, as a function of position X. The electric field is going to be dV dx, okay, the derivative with respect to X. And because of convention, we also have, note that you have this negative sign there. Okay. So the electric field is the negative derivative of voltage with respect to position. Charge is the derivative of the electric field, dE dx. Okay. And uh, just the one little thing you need to remember with charge is that you have this thing here. It's one over epsilon. And epsilon is the dielectric constant. So let me just put that here. Epsilon equals dielectric constant of the material that you're working with. Okay, now, um, if you take the, uh, uh, if you integrate the electric field, if you integrate the charge, you'll get the electric field. And so let's look at what that looks like. So you elect E of X, is equal to one over epsilon. The one over epsilon comes from the fact that you have this epsilon here. One over epsilon integral from negative infinity to x of rho of x dx. Okay, notice we're doing that from negative infinity to point x of the charge density. So we integrate the charge density once to find the electric field. And we integrate the electric field to find the voltage integral from negative infinity to x of E of x, the electric field, that will give us a, a voltage. And don't forget these factors here, you have a negative sign when you convert electric, to, uh, electric field to voltage. All right, any questions? Um, more so a curiosity thing on the dielectric constant. Um, mm -hmm. So I know we, you know, you consider the dielectric constant a lot with uh, capacitors, you know, let's say if you have um, <clears throat> air or Teflon or, you know, what, whatever's in between there. Um, with our, our, our capacitor, I guess, uh, the depletion region, it has kind of almost two different types of materials. So our, our dielectric constant, is it, is it kind of averaged out or is it just, you know, Ah, good, good question. Good question. Well, when we use, um, when we do this uh, capacitance, when we figure out the capacitance of a junction, which we'll do later, um, we use the dielectric constant for silicon, which happens to be a, mm -hmm. a constant. I see. I and see. even the dielectric constants, um, that, I suppose it would change a little bit if you have doping, uh, if the silicon is doped. But, um, I don't think it's enough where we consider a different dielectric constant in the N and P materials. Ah, I see, okay. But that's a good question. That's a very good question. Dielectric constant, by the way, it has to do with how well a material supports an electric field. Some electric, some materials, um, you know, mainly like uh, insulators, uh, they're good at, if you put a charge on the top side of the material, charge on the top side of the uh, bottom side of the material, it'll create an electric field inside the material. And the stronger that electric field is, the higher the dielectric constant of the material. Okay. At the physical level, it has to do with the polarizability of the material. Like uh, uh, um, when you put a positive charge on one side of the material, negative charge on the other side, the molecules the molecules within the material, they actually align to, um, uh, to the charges. And those things are called dipoles. We're not gonna go into the details of that. That's, that's an electromagnetics, uh, that's for an electromagnetics class. But the more dipoles a material has, the, the higher the dielectric constant it has. Um, okay, and conductive material, by the way, is, has uh, you know, very low dielectric constants because it doesn't support an electric field well. Okay, so um, basically we've covered this idea that you can integrate, uh, to find the voltage, you can integrate the charge to once to find the electric field and again to find the electrostatic potential or voltage. So that's exactly what we're going to do 
here with the, um, uh, uh, with the electrostatics of the depletion region. We know what the charge density is. We know what the charge density is. That's what we uh, found earlier. Okay, so we have this plot. Now from charge density, we want to derive the electric field plot. And from the electric field plot, we want to derive the voltage plot. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use that strategy of integration. So starting with, um, starting with this one, oops. So starting with this one here, uh, the charge density, we have a relationship for that. Um, the charge density as a function of X is equal to Q times ND. Now in order, uh, and it's equal to negative Q times NA down here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this plot and integrate, integrate everything to the left of it, at, at, to the left of some point X. So what do I mean by that? Electric field is equal to one over epsilon integr integral from negative infinity to X of rho of x dx. So we're, I'm going to go through that step by step with you, okay? Uh, just as an exercise. So let's say we are at, um, let's call this t0, okay? What is going to be the value of this integral at t0? Zero. It's going to be zero. Um, was that Corey? Yep. Okay. So Corey, why is it going to be zero? Um, at well, uh, at t zero, as you have it drawn there, um, there's uh, like nothing under the curve. So. Yeah. There's no. <laughs> yep. There's no area under the curve to the left of t zero. So, electric field equal to zero. So now let's say we get to, um, when we get to here, it's still zero, but when we get to, let's say T1, let's call this T1. At T1, we are gonna start having some area under, um, area to the left of the curve. So at T1, here, let me just, um, let me draw this, it's a little bit cleaner. So if we want, want to find the electric field here, we have to do an integral of everything to the left of the, this curve here. Okay. So this integral here, rho of x, this integral here is going to have some kind of negative value associated with it. Okay. And then that is going to be multiplied by one over epsilon. And so you're going to have some kind of negative electric field associated with it. So that's why you see this region here becoming progressively more negative. So if I move T1, if I move T1 over this way, now you're gonna have more area and the maximum, let's call this T2, the maximum that you're going to get is when you get right to X equals zero. You're gonna have most of the negative area under the curve. So that's why you see that the electric field reaches a maximum at x equals zero, because you're basically integrating the entire negative region. Okay. Now the mathematics of this, I mean, you can you can think about um, you know what happens when you integrate a constant value. You notice that this is a constant value. What's the integral of a constant? Just a general mathematic principle. Ramp. A ramp, yeah, a linear function. So the integral of a linear, um, the integral of a constant is a linear function. So you end up getting a linear, a line that starts at zero, you know, at negative xp0, 
at the edge of the depletion region, the electric field is still zero. The electric field increases linearly until you get to um, the interface, x equals zero. At that point, it's reached the maximum electric field. And that maximum electric field is important, okay? And that is given by, well, you can actually figure out what that maximum electric field is. If you just plug in x equals zero up here, you take the integral of q times na times dx. Uh, it's very easy to just integrate that. And then you end up getting negative q over epsilon xp zero times na. Okay. And it turns out because of space charge neutrality, this xp zero times na, you can also substitute xn zero times nd there. Okay, so both these formulas are valid for finding the maximum electric field. Now, if you also kind of think about it, it, it kind of makes sense because if you have a whole bunch of positive charges on one side and a whole bunch of negative charges on the other side, it kind of makes intuitive sense that the maximum electric field will, re will occur right in the middle of those two sets of charges because you're getting the effects of one, one type of charge and you're also getting the effects of the other type of charge. And once you're out of the depletion region, the electric field goes to zero because of these charge screening effects. The positive and negative charges kind of cancel each other once you go outside the depletion region. That's called charge screening. All right, so what happens now, let's mathematically find what happens after that. So once you get start getting to positive values, let's say, we're looking at, let's call this T3. At T3, we now have to consider, when we take the integral, everything to the left of T3, we have to consider this positively charged region. So this is gonna contribute some positive area under the curve. But then we also have to consider all this negative stuff here too, all right? So if we, if we start at T2, okay, we start at, at um, this is where the maximum electric field was, the maximum negative area under the curve here, maximum negative area under the curve. And now we're, uh, we're incrementally adding positive area under the curve. So that's why this reaches a maximum here, but then it starts to go, it starts to go increasingly, to, um, it starts to have a positive slope and then eventually it reaches zero here at, um, let's call this T4. At T4, you have all of this positive area under the curve and that positive area cancels out all the negative area under the curve, right? Because remember Q plus is equal to Q minus. These two areas are equal to each other. So the two cancel and the electric field basically goes back down to zero. Okay, so I mathematically showed you that, you know, by taking the integrals, and I didn't do any math here. I just showed you, like, kind of visually, pictorially, like that taking the in, er, by taking the areas under the curve, by taking the integral that way, you can come up with this, um, uh, this linear function, this piecewise linear function that represents the electric field. Okay, so anything beyond this, um, anything beyond T4, the electric field is zero out here. So this is all zero. All right. So now that we have that, we can take another step and we can say, well, now that we have the electric field, we can also find the electrostatic potential. And to do that, we take the integral of the electric field. So that is this formula right here. The electrostatic potential is equal to the negative integral of the electric field. So again, we're taking the integral of everything to the left of a certain point x. So visually, let's do the same thing. Um, I'm gonna erase this for a second so there's less clutter on this uh, portion of the slide. So when we're at, let's say T0, we take the integral of everything to the left of that. 
So the, so the electric, uh, electric field is zero, but the integral is also zero. So the voltage basically equal to zero. Um, so yeah, T1, now we're taking some of the area under the curve, right? When we take the integral of that, we multiply it by this negative sign. Don't forget this negative sign here. So at T1, um, voltage increases. All right, so the voltage starts to increase, increase, increase until we get to T2. At T2, we've reached, well, we haven't reached a maximum yet. So at T2, we've considered uh, all this negative area here. Okay. Now, um, I asked you before, mathematically, when you take the integral of a constant, you get a linear function. What happens when you take the integral of a linear function? So what's the integral of parabolic. x? You get a parabolic function, that's right. The integral of a linear function is a parabolic function. So this thing that we see here, this was a linear function. The electric field was linear with respect to x. When we take the integral of a linear uh, uh, function, we're basically finding the area under the curve, the, the integral there is going to be a quadratic function. So this, you can think about this as a parabola. This portion here is like a parabola. Here, it's an integrated um, align. Yeah, uh, go so ahead. This is um, pretty much two, two different parabolas that have um, one, I guess, concave upwards, one concave downwards. That's right. So yeah. our point of inflection is pretty much where our um, electric field is at its maximum. Exactly, you got it, you got it. So if we, um, if we keep going here at T3, you know, now we're still getting more area under the curve, right? But you can see that the, we're adding less and less area each time. So the voltage will still increase, but it'll increase at a slower rate. And that's why you see this portion just tailing off like this. Once you get beyond T4, now there's um, no additional area to integrate. So the plot just stays horizontal like this. All right, so again, this portion of the curve, this is also a line. So as we integrate this line, the integral of a line is a parabola. So this is also a parabola. And um, as Melvin pointed out, this is concave down. And this one was concave up. All right. So when you know the details of this, um, you know, it's always good as a way to kind of like review some mathematical principles, but it really helps you kind of understand how the integrals are resulting in these shapes of electric fields, these shapes of electrostatic potential, that um, I think it's more valuable to kind of do it this way than to just you know, write out the math equations, okay? So um, in terms of what we're usually very interested in is we're interested in how do we calculate V0? We already know one way to calculate V0 because we have that relationship earlier, but it turns out when we do this particular analysis, we have a second relationship for V0. And that, uh, that relationship looks something like this. So um, the voltage at Xn0, so the voltage out here, okay, this is Xn0, is equal to the negative integral from negative infinity to Xn0 of E of X dx. Um, and then uh, it turns out that this is equal to negative W over two E, e of zero. Okay, I'm not, I'm, showing, I'm not showing you all the integral steps. There, it's nothing complicated. It's just the usual uh, integration. 
And then, so this becomes equal to W over two Q over epsilon XP zero times NA by the space charge neutrality law, XP zero and A is equal to X and zero and D. So these are two equivalent ways of expressing the built-in potential. Now, interestingly, we have another relationship for the built-in potential here. What was the first relationship? Let's go back to our slides here. This is another equation for the built-in potential. So this equation, is putting the built-in potential in terms of the doping on the N and P sides, N, A, N, D. And N, I squared is, of course, is just a constant. So this relationship gives us the built-in potential as a function of the doping. Now, if we go to this equation that we just derived using electrostatics, we have a built-in potential that in terms of the depletion width, the width of the depletion region, but this is W, okay? And uh, as a function of XP zero and the doping, okay? So this, this is giving us some additional information. So if we know the doping, I'll, I'll give you the punchline here right now, is that if you know the doping, you can not only figure out the built-in potential, you can also figure out XP zero and, and the width. So you can actually figure out the physical dimensions of the depletion region just by knowing what the doping is, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Because we can't, we can't go into the semiconductor material and somehow probe or, or measure how wide the depletion region is. It's just impossible to do that. So it's really valuable to have these the, you know, fairly simple formulas that actually tell us about the physical dimensions of the depletion region. I think that's pretty neat. All right, so uh, this slide is on calculating the depletion widths. So as I said before, we have formulas for electric field and voltage in terms of the width, of the width on the P side and the width on the N side. So now we can calculate these dimensions in terms of doping. So um, all we're gonna do is combine relationships that we've found earlier. This is the space charge neutrality rule. And then this is the, the width of, you know, the total width of the junction is equal to the width on the P side plus the width on the N side. All right, so just using these two formulas here, we can come up with um, uh, two formulas that represent the width of the P, uh, depletion width on the P side, depletion width on the N side. Um, as a function of W and the doping ratios, NA and ND. Next set of equations is that we plug, uh, we plug into this formula for V0 from uh, the previous slide. Okay, so we had this relationship for P0, V0, W over two Q over epsilon XP0 times Q and A. All right, and so all we did here is that we substituted a value for x, um, xp0. So we have this formula for xp0 here, wnd over na plus nd. So all we did here is we substituted that in here, and we're left with w squared over 2, q over epsilon, na nd over na plus nd. All right, and with a little bit of mathematical manipulation, we can find this relationship. The width of the depletion region, including both the N and the P sides, is equal to the square root of two times epsilon times V0 over Q, one over NA plus one over ND. Okay, so let's uh, just, um, you're gonna be using this formula to calculate the depletion width. So I wanna point out a few things here. Um, This is the uh, epsilon, okay? This is equal to epsilon zero times epsilon r, okay? When we talk about dielectric constants, it's convention to uh, split up the dielectric constants into two different parts. There's one part that's fixed, and this epsilon zero is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 
14 farads per centimeter. Okay, that is epsilon zero. And then epsilon r, it depends on what material you're working with. Okay, and then I'm just gonna put a note here that for silicon, epsilon r is um, roughly equal to 11. Okay, that's a value that we can use for the purposes of this class. So that is how you get your epsilon values here. And then V0, your built-in potential, you already have an equation for V0, you know, KT over Q, ln of N, A, N, D over N, I squared. All right, so you have to calculate V0 first, and then you can calculate the depletion widths. Okay, you have your one over N, A, one over N, D here. So what this is telling us, okay, because you have one over N, A, and then one over N, D, if you increase the doping, if you increase the doping, then uh, this term is going to become, um, increase the doping Na and Nd become larger. Na and Nd become larger. So this term in parentheses becomes smaller. Okay, and that turns out to be the, um, uh, the dominant term here. And that ends up making your width smaller. Okay, notice that NAND also comes into this VO term as well. Right? If, if you increase NA and ND, the voltage, uh, the built-in potential is gonna increase. But remember that the, that the built-in potential is the log of NAND over NI squared. So this V0 term, so let's say we increase the doping, as I said before, if you increase the doping, these two terms, they would become, uh, this parentheses term would become smaller at a fast rate. And the V0 term would, um, would increase, but it would, it would um, uh, uh, that would do so at a slower rate. So the net effect on the width is that the width will become smaller with higher doping. Okay, that's a good rule of thumb to remember. Higher doping, smaller depletion width. And then the final thing here, is now we can solve for XP0 and XN0 in terms of doping. So um, if I ask you to find the depletion widths just on the P or the N sides, you can use uh, this formula here. Now, most of the time, what I would do is probably just calculate the total width. So use this formula and then um, use these formulas to calculate the relative widths on the N and P sides. But it's up to you. You know, you, you could go directly to um, number three and just calculate it directly. So that's fine. That's fine as well. So these calculations, there's a lot of numbers you have to put in there. So there's always a chance for error. Um, you know, make sure you check over your work when you're using some of these formulas. Okay. Uh, typical values that you might get for the depletion widths might be on the order of tens to hundreds of micrometers. For the for silicon and for the doping values that we typically use, you know, tens to hundreds of um, micrometers might be might be reasonable. All right, professor. Yes, I had, a, I had a question about the last slide. Um, sure, sure. So you said we could find the um, v naught with the na and nd terms and a kt term as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have those terms, the KT, the NA, and ND, um, can, we could figure out the width and the XP knot and the XN knot, right? It looks like. That's right. Just yeah. from those terms. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for highlighting that point. I mean, basically, in a diode, in a PN junction, if you have the doping on the N side and you have the doping on the P side, you can figure all this stuff out. Everything that you see on this slide just depends on the doping on the N and, N and P sides. Okay. All right. So let's take um, let's take a specific example. Um, so it's in a single-sided junction, um, just I want I want you to see how these formulas simplify if you have a what's called a single-sided junction. Uh, for example, let's say you have a P plus N diode which means the acceptor density, the doping on the P side 
is much larger than the doping density on the enzyme, so the ND. So in that case, you know, you still have these same formulas, XP0 and XN0, um, but I want you to see how they might uh, simplify. I guess I didn't, um, I guess something got deleted from a previous version of the slide. So let's just take these formulas and assume that NA is much greater than ND. Okay, let's just go through this real quick. Oops. How is this going to simplify if NA is much greater than ND? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the denominator. So look at the denominator of that equation. Just get rid of uh, ND. Yeah, that's right. So if NE is much greater than ND, right, if this is true, then this term is going to disappear because it's much smaller than the NA term. So you're gonna be left with W times ND over an A. All right, and how about this XN zero term? If NA is much greater than ND, again, you can cross out the ND. And now interestingly, what happens, you're left with W times NA divided by NA. So the NAs cancel. This is approximately equal to W. So what is this telling us? If you have a P plus N dial, so I'm just gonna draw this out here. So this is P plus, and then this is N. This is the interface between the two materials. This is telling us is that the depletion width on the P side is going to be tiny compared to the depletion width on the N side. So it's gonna look like a one-sided junction like this. So you have a very high density of space charge of negative space charge on this side. And then you have a low density of space charge on this side. So um, this is X equals zero. This is negative X sub P and this is X sub N. So you have a very wide um, depletion region on the N side. And you can't see this well, but I'm drawing negative charges here. <laughs> and a very narrow region of negative charges on the P side. So when this happens, you can say that this is a one-sided junction, a single-sided junction, and a lot of these formulas simplify. It can save you time on tests. Simple formulas also give you more intuition. The Xn zero, for example, is approximately, is approximately equal to the width of the junction. Right? That means the width of the junction is primarily due to the width on the x uh, on the n side of the junction. Similarly, okay, so you have Na is greater than Nd. So if you have one over Na and one over Nd, how's that gonna look? So what's gonna happen to the parentheses here for the total width? will be just one over ND, because one over NA will be a very small number. Exactly, exactly, you got it, excellent. So if NA is greater than ND, one over NA is going to be small compared to one over ND. So this term will go away. So you're gonna be left with one over ND. And so that simplifies your equation. So the width will then become two epsilon V zero over Q, and D. And you can imagine these same simplifications would happen if you had an N plus P junction. You just have to, you know, you, you just, they just become, you would become one over NA instead of one over ND. So you could re-derive the simplifications here. What I want you to know is just how to remove certain terms. 
Okay, in this case, um, this last one here, NA, if NA is much greater than ND, then this term goes away, this term goes away. All right, and so then you're left with ND over NA squared. Here you're left with NA over ND times NA. So the NA terms go away and then you're left with just one over ND. Okay, so you can see how these formulas would, would simplify. All right, so moving on, um, calculating depletion characteristics. Um, suppose we have a step PN junction with NA equals 10 to the 18th and ND equals five times 10 to the 15th. Uh, draw a plot of charge density, electric field, and voltage. In the plot, include numeric values of the charge, built-in potential, and dimensions of the depletion region. Now, um, sometimes I end up skipping over this, but since we only have 10 minutes left today, um, I don't want to um, I don't want to go into a new topic today um, because then we'll just have to come back to it next class. So, uh, since we have the 10 minutes, I'll just uh, go through this example. Um, you know, in a um, fairly quickly, and we'll, we'll go through it together. All right, so let's let's see here. Let's see if I can make this larger. All right, this should be fine. There we go, a little bit more room there. All right. So step PN junction with NA equals 10 to the 15th, ND equals five times 10 to the 15th. Okay, and here's your interface between the two materials. And then we'll just have a long dotted line that comes down like this. Um, the first thing we're going to do is row of x. The row of x plot will look something like this. So the n side has low doping and the p side has high doping. So this is gonna definitely be a one-sided junction. And we can't draw this to scale because you can see that the doping on the p side is 10 to the 18th and the doping on the n side is five times 10 to the 15th. That means that the depletion widths are going to have a ratio of like the, the, the width on the N side is going to be three orders of magnitude larger than the doping than the width on the P side. So, you know, we're not going to draw things to scale, but I'll just try to show the fact that you have a one sided junction. So this is going to be equal to negative Q times N A. And then this is going to be Q times ND. So it's going to be wide like this. All right, so you imagine that this is all positive charge. And this is negative charge. Okay, so uh, that's probably sufficient for the uh, charge density plot. Then we can draw our electric field plots. Electric field plot is going to be negative. And we know what the electric field plots are going to look like. It's going to start at xp, negative xp0, and it's going to go down like this. And then out here at 
x and 0. It's going to go up like this. And then this is something that I would like you to label on these plots, what the maximum electric field is. So this is going to be E of 0. This is the maximum electric field. And that's something that we can calculate real quick. So all we have to do is go back here. We have our formulas here that we can quickly look at. Right. So, um, uh, e of zero is negative uh, Q over epsilon XP zero times NA. Um, yeah, XP zero and A, sorry about that. Okay, so this is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. So our epsilon is equal to um, uh, 8.85 times 10 to the negative 14 farads um, per centimeter. And then the relative dielectric constant for silicon is 11. Uh, Q is given in coulombs. So the X sub P, we have to, um, we actually have to calculate that first. And then we have to, uh, uh, we have our NA. So let's leave this blank for a second. And then uh, our NA, which we're given is 10 to the 18th per centimeter cubed. Okay, so that's the first part there. Uh, second part is that we can actually calculate what uh, XP0 and XN0 are. Um, we're gonna use some of the shortcuts here. Uh, we need to find out XP0 uh, we have three minutes here. So with XP0, uh, if we simplify this, what do we find? Uh, it's two epsilon V0 over Q, um, ND over NA, and then there's NA plus ND. Okay, remember, we're doing the example of a one-sided junction. So uh, the P side has a much larger doping than the N side. So this will simplify to um, ND over NA squared. All right, so let's do our XP0 calculation here, XP0. We also need to do our V0 calculation before that, fine. Um, let's start off with this. V0 is equal to KT over Q, LN of NA and D over NI squared. So this is equal to 0 0.026 LN, of 10 to the 18th, five times 10 to the 15th, divided by ni squared, 1.5 times 10 to the 10 squared. All right, so I need, uh, I need everybody's help so we can uh, finish this off quickly. Uh, can someone with a calculator help me out with this? Tell me what the V0 is. And in the meantime, I will set up the XP0 equation here. So the XP0 equation will look like two epsilon V0 over Q. And this is going to be ND over NA squared. Um, for V naught, I got 4.99 e to the negative 20. 4.99 to 10 to the negative 20. Ooh. Um, that seems like it may be off. Okay. I got you know, 0 0.8. 0 0.8? Yeah, 0 0.8. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds about right. 0.8 volts, I, I remember that. You know, your built-in potential should somewhere be 
for silicon, it should usually range between 0.6 and 0.8 volts, maybe a little bit more, you know, larger range than that. Okay, so see, maybe you just made a small calculation error there. Um, so oh, I did. Yep, I had yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, good, good. So this is going to be two times eight point eight five times ten to the negative fourteen times eleven times point eight over one point six times ten to the negative nineteen. So again, like these calculations require a lot of numbers. So um, there's always a potential to make mistakes here. So your ND is five times ten to the fifteenth. over um, NA squared, so 10 to the 18th squared. So hopefully I'm not making any calculation errors here. Um, maybe someone can help me out with that. I'm just about done here. I got 2.2 .2 times 10 to the minus 7, but I don't know if that's right. 2.2 .2 okay. times 10 to the minus 7? I got the same, same number. OK, that sounds, that sounds about right. Um, uh, and the units for this is going to be centimeters. Keep that in mind. OK, let's just go with that today, since we're just about out of time here. Um, and uh, let's see. So this is the number that you plug in here to get your electric field. So let's just go ahead and do that. 3.6 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, 3.6 times 10 to the fourth. There's a negative sign here and the units are gonna be volts per centimeter. Okay. When you work with these problems, just keep in mind the units of these. Um, so, you know, your voltage units are obviously gonna be in volts. Um, density units is always one over centimeter cubed. I know I didn't include the centimeters cubed up here. Um, the one important note is this epsilon zero. Okay. The units for this is farads per centimeter. If you've taken physics classes, you've often probably seen 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 farads per meter. But in this class, everything is done in terms of centimeters. Don't ask me why the field just does every, <laughs> the units for doing solid state calculations for some reason is in centimeters, really weird. Uh, so we use this, uh, a different version of the uh, epsilon zero. And when you calculate your electric fields, you'll have your electric fields in volts per centimeter instead of volts per meter. You can convert them, of course, but that's that's fine. Okay, so um, you know these are some uh, typical values. So you've drawn out uh, what do we do here in this example problem? We uh, calculated the we drew the charge density, electric field, and voltage. Uh, we included some numeric values of um, the electric field, built-in potential, and the dimensions of the depletion region. So um, you know I'm not going to write them down in this plot, but um, you know th this would be the value of xp zero. Um, the maximum electric field that you see here, E sub zero, would be negative 3.6 times 10 to the fourth. And this last plot, oh, I guess I forgot to do that one. We'll just end with that real quick. So the electrostatic potential, V of X, is going to start off at zero. And then from XP zero, from here, it's from this point here, it's going to be a concave parabola like this. And then... Um, to xn zero, 
is going to be a concave down parabola like this. And then after x n zero is just going to be flat. Okay, so that's what the built-in potential is going to look like. And the y value for here is going to be what we calculated is our 0.8 volts. Okay, so now you have um, the full picture of the electrostatics of the depletion region. You have the charge density, the electric field, and the electrostatic potential. Okay, so this is a good stopping point for today. Um, any questions before we end lecture for today? Okay, then next time um, on Monday's class, we will uh, go over, uh, we'll start, start, start talking about the forward bias and reverse bias. So the steady state behavior of the diode and probably next Wednesday, we'll get into the transient or time varying uh, uh, behavior of the diode. All right, um, remember the, uh, your, um, your project outlines are due either today or Friday or sometime if you need extra time, it's fine. Next week, uh, next Wednesday, the quiz is due. So make sure you do the homeworks for module four. And um, next week, I will post the homeworks for module five. And we'll have our quiz on that the following week. All right, uh, good luck. If you have any questions, uh, please email me and uh, I'll see you on Monday. Thanks. All right, thank, thank you. you.